Yay, thank you. All right, we'll get started then. Hmm? Okay, thank you. I think I just fixed it. All right. Yeah. All right. So um, I think there's some new faces in here. Um, I, all of the code that I'm going to be going over is at this particular site. Hold on. <sighs> Which way is my mouse moving, or is it just not working? Uh. I don't think it's working. <laughs> no, I saw it. I see it. It's uh, it's on the screen. So tiny. They in it doesn't <laughs> doesn't work very well. On okay, where is it? Right there in the lower. It was in the lower left. Right there. Uh, you see it? Got it? Well, it's not on my screen. <laughs> it's on the presentation in the lower left. It was. Yeah, my, and it won't go to the other one. Go to the other oh. one. Ah, finally. Yeah, have to bring it back to the yeah, and it's always the counterintuitive way it goes. So today we're going to be covering the chi-square test. Um, it, it's uh, another, we went over t-test in the last class, but it is a pretty simple statistical test um, and hopefully it will give you a good idea of or of the basics so if you don't already have this um, all the files the PowerPoint the data set that I'm using the code are all at my website uh, at this uh, link you can scroll to the bottom and it'll actually go to a shared drive um, that will have all these files in it um, also, my website, our videos, I post these eventually after class. Um, I, you can go to that, and if you have to miss a week, you can go through there. So something that I just talked to uh, the uh, individuals at the library about, um, when, I did, I, when I did my MPH Master's in Public Health at Washington University, they did something towards the end of our program every year. Um, individuals who wanted to could do a data analysis project and then they would invite employers into the university to come and visit and speak with the people that did each poster. Um, and that was, I've gotten a lot of feedback of people just like, how do I meet employers? How do I get into the field? And my answer is always, somehow you need to display with a project or somehow um, if you're not already in the field how, that you know how to use the programming language and then you know how to do the math part of it. Um, so one way that we're going to do that, I'm going to network with employers. Um, the individual at the head of the library is going to network with employers. Um, Rick, could you use that up? Um, so we can try to get as many in here as possible, possibly recruiters as well. So I'll give more information on the date, but it's probably going to be in a Thursday evening at some point um, in 2020, at the beginning of 2020. So just when we're going through, you can go through and think, oh, this might be a good idea for a project. And then you can get an idea of what you would want to do. Um, and I can do some help sessions to help you guys uh, and answer questions. So hopefully that will be um, something that you all would be interested in. So what is a chi-squared test? Um, last week we talked, or the last class, we talked about a test um, where we're looking at two groups and we have numeric or continuous data and we're comparing those two groups. Today we're comparing two groups of categorical variables. Um, That'll make more sense in a second. So um, we are using frequencies from two groups and we're comparing them. Um, what this test tells you is if those two groups are related or not. Um, so the null hypothesis, which we've talked about, is, or the default hypothesis before we go into this test, um, is that the two variables are independent. Um, there is a, uh, it, so you don't have to download the software, and this is good for everybody to know. Um, if you Google RStudio Cloud, um, you do have to make an account, but you can go in there 
and do an online session. You don't have to download anything and then you can follow the code if you'd like. Okay. Um, so we are going to be comparing those two categorical variables, trying to see if, whether they have a relationship or they're related. So we're default assuming there is no relationship and we're trying to prove that there is a relationship when we run this test. So as I just said, the null hypothesis or the default hypothesis would be the two categorical variables are totally independent of one another. One does not depend on the other. Um, the alternative hypothesis would be that they are dependent or have a, some type of relationship between those two variables. So here's, a, I'm gonna give two pretty um, large examples today. Um, one from more of a healthcare setting and one from uh, uh, if you were working for a Facebook or a Google that produces a website. And the first one, um, so not necessarily in the United States, but elsewhere in the world, there's a, lar a large problem with tuberculosis. So um, I, this is just a hypothetical example. Usually when somebody gets tuberculosis, they end up with, a, on average, a 15 day ho hospital stay. So the state is not real, but, um, Theoretically, if you had a drug that was supposed to um, decrease that hospital stay to 10 days. So you could say at 10 days, you could test to what, them what, with a tuberculosis test, whether they have it or whether they don't. In this case, we are going to compare men and women. So what you're seeing down here um, is a frequency table. So the amount of data points in each one of these groups so we're going to be comparing men and women and whether the test is more effective for women than it is for men or vice versa. So that's an example of what we would actually do with this uh, with this individual uh, test. So we would have two groups in here, the results of the tuberculosis, uh, tuberculosis test, negative, positive, and the gender of the individual, so female or male. So that's what I mean by two categorical variables. And these, um, sorry for the tiny mouse that does something weird, um, but the middle under the negative and positive and the female and male, those are frequencies that are in each group. So for instance, 70 individuals would have tested negative and they were female. Um, 66 individuals would have tested negative and they're male. Um, and similarly, uh, the 21 individuals would have tested positive and they were male at 10 days after the start of the Are there any questions about this before we move on? Okay. So our default is um, we're estimating or we're assuming that these two variables, gender and testing positive for tuberculosis are totally independent. Gender does not affect your test on the, the real result on the tuberculosis test. So, what the chi-square does uh, compares what actually happened to what theoretically would have happened if they were totally unrelated. Um, so I'm going to show you how to get those values um, and uh, estimate what would have happened if they were not related, but that's all it's doing. So there is a formula in order to estimate what would have happened based on these frequencies. So you basically assume um, that the individuals, uh, there's going to be a certain number of females and males, and then you will estimate um, what would have happened if there was no relationship. So this is actually how you do that. So we are seeing, and these are what actually happened in our sample of our data. So in our experiment, we ran females and males. This is what we just saw on the last slide. So what actually happened? And we need to estimate what would have happened if there was no relationship with these two variables, gender and tuberculosis, positive or negative. So, so in each cell, you will take, to get that expected value, if they were independent, you would take the row sum, which down here, um, I added 70 plus 66, and that equals 136. Um, and then you would take the, the column sum, so that's the column sum, and then you would sum the row as well. So 70 plus 15 is 85. So simply, you would take the um, column sum times the row sum and divide by the total number of observations that are in your data set. 
So in this particular case, um, that is what we're seeing here. So basically assuming that there are 136 negative and uh, 85 positive, uh, it, yeah, 136 neg negative and 85 females, they are going to equally distribute or put the correct amount in those cells that would have happened if there was no relationship. Um, so again, it's the row sum times the column sum divided by the total sum. Um, and this is if there is no relationship. That's a bit confusing. Are there any questions about that? Okay. But so if there is no relationship, you're saying there's no relationship between men and women having this. Yes. So, test. yeah. So, in, in other words, if there is no relationship, that would mean that it, statistically, um, men and women are getting the same or close to the same number of positives and negatives. You can see here that um, they are different. That's obvious. Um, but when you run a statistical test, the idea is to see if they were significantly different from one another. So would not have happened by chance, basically. So we are trying to estimate um, are we sure enough that this didn't happen by chance? Are they extremely, are the difference extreme enough to assume that this couldn't have happened by chance? I, my question is going to be, so why would you, uh, there's no correlation between men and women being dependent on Why would you add it to, why would you just say 15 as 70 and that's a percentage? Right? Figure out the percentage of that. So you have to take into account the total number. Um, so in the rows and the columns, so you have to basically distribute this. So we have to take into account that there were only 36 positives in both groups and we have to, um, it, take into account that, um, there were 136 negatives as well. So then you also have to take into account that there were 85 female and 85 males. So then you have to evenly distribute. And the reason you can think of it similar to an average, you are dividing by that 172 number. Um, so one over scores before. So this is similar to that in that we're standardizing this. The yeah, exactly. We're splitting the difference between those two groups, given that we know there's 85 females, uh, 136 negatives, 36 positives, and 87 male in our data set. Uh, for example, say we had um, 80 individuals here, um, if this 172 was 80, and we had uh, we had 20, 20 females, 20 males, um, 20 negatives, and 20 positives. So if you had that, and it was divisible by four, this would be 20. The expected values, it would be 20, 20, 20, 20, and 80 would be here. It's basically giving them the same negative rate for both men and women, yes. like 79%. Yeah. So if there was no relationship, we're not going to see any difference between this male and female. And this is running um, and those expected values. So you'll see here 85 um, it times 136 um, divided by 172. So this 67.2 would be the expected value for this cell. Okay, does that make sense? I know these classes build upon one another and people come in and it's a little difficult, but the videos are online if you want to go back through. <coughs> right, and there, this, I'm calculating it by hand first to show you what it does, and then I'm going to show you how to go into the program and actually do it without all the background and doing the math. So now you can see here, um, so this is what actually happened. This is what we would expect to happen if there wouldn't have been any difference between male and female for positive and negative tests. So in this particular sample, there are less men than women. Um, and then that positive result was much more rare than the negative. So that's kind of how. Um, so you'll see that these are very similar um, if you go back at here. So we have 85 and 87 individuals, so they're pretty close to one another. The, it, when you design a study, you usually want to have, and you're looking at gender, you would want to have equal amounts or close to it. 
So that's why we're seeing that these two numbers are really similar. Um, we're seeing that the negative and positive are very different. Um, but if you see here, um, the negative is much more common than the positive over here as well. So hopefully you can think of it sort of as an average, but because we don't have, we have groupings instead of say, a, if tuberculosis test gave uh, a continuous or num numeric data, we would, wouldn't do it this way. So um, say you had a white blood cell count come in. So you would actually be able to find the average in that case, but we can't do that here because it's both of them are groups or categorical variables. So now, and it's, the logic is very similar here. So as I said, the chi-square um, compares the observed with the expected and tries to find if they are significantly different from one another. So you're seeing here, this is just the equation. So we have this observed minus the expected, and we do this for each individual cell. So, and then we square that value. In a lot of statistical tests, you'll see um, when they, we might have a number that is, uh, the observed is smaller than a, the expected. Um, so that would output negative value. In a lot of statistical tests, they will square it or find the absolute value, which is basically saying how far away it is from zero, or squaring gets rid of the negative number as well. So when we square something, say we had um, five and five, um, we multiplied them together, uh, it, we would think the square, uh, the square root so of 25 would be five. Um, so that's how you would explain this, it, squaring. So five times five would be um, this two means we're multiplying five times five. If you had five to the third, it would be five times five times five and so on and so forth. But when you multiply, uh, say when you subtract this, if this number is larger, it's going to output a negative value. But when you square it, that value is going to become positive. Um, so that gives us the information we can so each individual point, you can think of this logically as, so 70, and I, I apologize, this should be 70. Um, I changed these a bunch of times, and that was a typo. So as to not confuse everybody. Mm. Okay, all right. Yeah, 72. All right, go back in. So I'm going to start going back and forth from the code um, to the PowerPoint. And as you saw, it's difficult to go from one or the other. Hey, so, should, should the second um, number in the top in the numerator be 66 instead of 65? Yes. So I changed this okay. several times. I apologize. I'll no, it's so, okay. I was just trying to figure out if I was following the, the yeah, signal notation. Yeah, that's why I went correctly. out in order to change it because yeah. um, uh, that was just a typo on my part. I apologize. So, um, and this would be 21. So that's what it should look like in practice. I'm going to fit to the window. Um, yeah, no worries. You just did it to keep us awake, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So get rid of the ribbon um, so we can see more. And I'm going to zoom in. Since I'm going to be going back and forth from R, this makes it a little less um, in and out and in and out. So here you're seeing the 70 value. Um, and then this 67, I rounded this down here. So we're taking that actual minus the expected. Um, we're squaring that and then dividing by the expected. So these are all the top second value is going to look really it's going to be the same as the bottom value. And and you might recognize this. So except for the squared, um, this is the same thing as a percent change. Um, when you look at this, say you were trying to compare one week to another and see how much uh, a value went up. So that's it's very similar to that. Um, so let's look logically at this first value. So the chi-square, um, try a way to think of it is for each individual cell, 
it's trying to estimate how much difference is between that observed and the expected. And then if they're really far apart, it's gonna add a larger number to our final value. Um, and then if it's really small, it's gonna add a much smaller value to our end result. So the larger it is, the more likely that those two groups are gonna be different from one another. So for instance, if you have um, this number, that it's going to produce a larger value than something that is closer together, um, like this number. So we are consecutively adding more, um, it, it, or we're looking at the error or the difference, we're adding more for each individual cell, and we're just summing those together. We have this value at the end. So it's 1.094. So if you go through and do this by hand, which I've actually done in the code here. So this is our original data. And I want to show you guys this. So if we go through, um, this is just reading in the data of the original data. So this is somewhat what you would look, get if you were handed this project from the start. Um, so each individual will usually have an ID number, a unique identifier. Um, the gender, it's going to list as male or female, and the results are going to be negative or positive, just like we saw before. So running that, um, just, and when you run things in R, um, sometimes you want to look at the, the top of the data if you didn't want to actually open the data set. This is just going to show you the first six rows. So now I'm creating a frequency table. So that's exactly what we just saw in the slides. So we're finding out the number, the number or the frequency that are male and female, so our gender variable. And then we're looking at positive and, and negative, which is our results variable. So if we do that, it's going to look something like this. So that's exactly what we just saw in our data set, um, that frequency table. Um, so we're going through. Um, I wanted to put this by hand in here as well. So this is exactly what you just saw in the slides, just typed out in code so that you don't have to get on a calculator and do the addition and the subtraction all. Um, so this can work as a calculator. Um, so we're taking the expected minus the actual, we're squaring it divided by the expected. We're adding that to the uh, observed minus the expected, squaring that over the expected. Um, so now we can see that that's 1.09. Um, if we go back into this, we're seeing that we're getting the same value. Um, so are there any questions about this before I move on? It's somewhat counterintuitive, <coughs> I know. Um, so Kelsey, I assume you left out for simplicity the, the sigma um, between the equal sign and the, the observed minus expected? Uh, wait, can you explain more what you mean? Um, yeah, because I, I was looking at the formula, and when you go observed minus expected, it's mm -hmm. each uh, divided by, okay, so observed minus expected squared over expected. That's for each cell. And, yes. and so I'm thinking about its sigma notation, right? Like you would have a sigma in front of that, to go, we've got yes. a, yeah. Yeah, so in general, I found that um, in, and I should have put some of in here, that's what he's saying, and I apologize for that. I can put that in. No, it's um, okay. I, I was yeah. just, like, for those so, of us who have a math brain, I'm like, wait a second. And <laughs> yeah, so usually they would put a symbol in front of this, um, but I'm assuming you guys don't have uh, a lot of information about that. Um, so if I wanted to put it in here, I would put a sum value in there, and I just look, forgot to leave that. I left it out. Yeah, so it looks like that. But I bet 90% of you have no idea what that looks like. So when I before I post the slides, I'll put a sum of. Um, so we're just adding all of those together. We're doing these for each individual cell, adding them together. So each cell the error is going to it's going to add a little bit more difference um, to our value. Um, so going forward, are there any other questions about this? OK. So 
Now there's a couple other things that we have to do to check for significance. Um, each statistical test you do is going to have something called degrees of freedom. It has directly, it's involved with the number of values or, that you have in your data set. Usually for almost every statistical test you ever see, it'll be the number of individuals minus one. Um, Chi-squared is a little different. So it's a very simple formula. Um, you take the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. Um, in this case, that's going to be, we have um, two rows and two columns. So it's going to be one times one. So our degrees of freedom is one. Um, when we went over the t-test, I showed you guys a table and I showed you how to go on the table, find the degrees of freedom, um, find what your critical value is. And that's another word for what this came out of. It's the chi-squared value. Um, and then in the middle, you can see whether your value is significant or not. Um, I want to go through that um, with, it's much easier to do in R. Um, and then I'm actually going to show you guys another example later where um, you can actually see it interactively online. But to get that value, you would have to either use R. Um, if you're more comfortable, there is a tool at this link that I just Googled and say, I asked it to find uh, a website that would, if you put in your chi-square value, your degrees of freedom to tell you what that significance value would be. And again, to recap, significance is telling you whether something is statistically significant or not. And what that means in practicality is, are those, uh, are those values for male and female different enough to assume that we probably got it right in this case and that, we, um, that they are different enough that that couldn't or was less likely to happen by chance? So you can't prove something as definitively true or definitively false. So you have to make sure they're different enough that that's unlikely to happen. So that'll make a little more sense in just a minute. And if you guys are confused about the statistically significant, there's a lot of videos online that will explain that in more detail. So we run a chi squared test in R. Um, all we do is we use this function. Um, you don't have to load any packages. Um, in the past, I've used some where you have to do that. In this case, you don't. Um, this is our table, as you saw up here. It's this value. Um, and there is a, R automatically makes a correction to make it harder to achieve statistical significance. It's out of the scope, um, but it just corrects your value. So if you want to run a standard just bare bones chi-squared test, you have to put correct equals false. I learned that the hard way. Um, so when you run this, um, I wanted to show you guys. Um, so it the chi-square result will produce a lot of things. So say I go chi. So we're seeing this like yellow, green, purple thing here. That means that this is, this, this is not a data frame and it's not one single value that it's producing. Data frame is like something you'd see in Excel. Um, so we are seeing here, and if we put in just similar to a data frame, we would use that dollar sign to see what all is in this data set. So now we're seeing um, we have the statistic, which would be the chi-square value, the parameter, which would be our degrees of freedom, our p-value, which tells us significance, what method we're using to calculate it, and a lot of other information. What if you're calculating this by hand, this expected is going to be really useful for us because this will show you our expected values, what we actually calculated by hand up here. So once you know what you're doing, it's much better to just use this very simplified function. Um, so we ran that um, and in order to print the full results, we would just take our value and run it. So we would print this. So now um, it's called Pearson's chi that we just ran. Um, so this X squared, that is the chi squared value that we had, and that's what we produced by hand. Um, it's telling us our P value is 2, 0.29, and that we already found out that our degrees of freedom equals one. So what does this mean in practice? 
Um, so we have 0.29 or we can say 0.3 if we round up. Um, so when we look at how different males and females are for our data, there's a, it, that difference is small enough that it's, there's a 30% chance that that happened totally randomly and by chance, that difference value. So the cutoff is usually 0.05 which would tell you say and i'm going to show a different example that is statistically significant so if it's below that 0.05 cutoff which is what is just the rule of thumb in statistics that means that there is less than a five percent chance that uh, that difference could have happened randomly or totally by chance so here there is a really a pretty high chance, 30%, that our differences just arose out of um, our sample. You random sample a population, and if you ran it again and again and again and again, 30 of those tests would show uh, at this same value or a difference level of this magnitude. Um, so when we have that, we can't. It, when we have something that's below above that 0.05 that means we cannot assume that males and females are different for the tuberculosis test so we have not given enough evidence to show that those two groups are different for that particular test so that's what this would tell us in practice so and i just went through here so if you come i try to do on every slide so if you look at the code, I, if you go in here, it tells you exactly how to run it. Um, and everything that I did, I show the code and exactly what creates it to try to help you. Because this, I teach, teach a programming class as well, but this I'm trying to do statistics because um, doing both at the same time is pretty overwhelming. So if you want more information about the coding, that that is available to you as well. So this is just what we saw. Um, I'm labeling this as the chi-squared value and this is the p-value. So it is not below 0.05, so it is not statistically significant. Okay, and that's exactly what I showed before. Um, we, in this case, cannot reject our null hypothesis, which means that we cannot, we have not given enough evidence that males and females are different for this tuberculosis test. All right, I'm going to go over another example, but are there any questions about this one? And I am new at this, so, and this is a lot harder to explain than, say, the normal distribution. So if you have questions, please go ahead. What is the difference between the normal, you know, like when I had taken the classes before, I always thought of the p value as being very similar as the. Mm -hmm the normal distribution of the z-score. Yeah, so in this case, so z-score uh, that we went over before, it's going to be continuous values, for instance. Um, we have groupings here, so you can't put it on a normal distribution because there's no continuous value to put in. Um, so it's for each statistical test that you have, it's going to have a distribution that looks very differently. So this, we have groups, um, and you you, they create that distribution and try to assign p-values to each one of those um, uh, those chi-squared values. So here, um, a specific p-value will be assigned to this as well as, as the degrees of freedom. So those together always produce this 0.29 value. So if you had uh, two degrees of freedom with the same result, um, your significance value would look similar. Um, so these are totally fixed, and it's something that you either have to look up usually, or you would have to do it with software. Um, so that's not something that you would ever know, um, just as a statistician. It's not. But somebody long time ago created that chi-square distribution, and then it would look similar to a normal distribution, but the cutoff of 0.05 would just, it would be in a different different spot, kind of. Um, does that make sense at all? <laughs> all right. Do you have an example of the numbers where it would be statistically significant? That's the next one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. So 
This one I wanted to do because we're eventually going to be getting to data science topics in here. So one thing that I, I had a long time ago, a um, interview at Facebook. And when I was doing a lot of research, I was like, OK, what do they do at Facebook? What's the kind of data science work that I would see at Facebook? Um, so a lot of like you would see this at many tech companies, anybody who has a um, a website that they go through and adjust over time. So you'll think that Facebook looks very different than it did five years ago. So how did they decide how to change it um, from the old website to the new website? So you probably don't know that this is happening. It's totally random. So when they're trying to decide whether they want to make a change to their website, they'll show you the old version and they'll pick uh, probably half of you randomly to show you the new version. They'll change one small little thing and then they'll look at how many times you've clicked on uh, through the Facebook site or how long you've looked at the page based on that small little change that they made. So if and a, a one group that saw that new web page um, clicked a bunch more times than um, that that old website, then they, that gives them some information that, oh, we should probably change to the new version. So it's something that's happening on the back end that you probably weren't ever aware of. But they're continuously running experiments on you. Um, so when you apply for a job there, one of the first questions that they ask you is, do you know how to run experiments? Do you know experimental design? And that's because this, on at a very small scale, it is an experiment that they're running. And they would run this test in order to see if their those two web pages um, created significantly more clicks. So they would actually be running this exact test. Um, so this is called A-B testing, what I just explained. So there is an example online. Um, the link is, if you go up here, this is the link to go to it. Um, what I try to do is to show you things several different ways, and then maybe one of them will stick. So there is an interactive at that particular link I just showed you. You can adjust, like say you wanted to pretend that this was 20 and this is 200, and then you could input those values and see how it changes over time. So I think that that's useful because then you can just play it around with it and see how your significance level changes and that'll help you understand what's going on. Um, but the example uh, in this case is you have 435 visitors to your website um, in total. So 18 out of the 220 um, users, uh, they saw website one, so the old website. Uh, six out of uh, 215 users, um, I, I saw website two. Um, so we are going to look at whether that um, difference we're seeing over here, just like we saw in the other case, these are frequencies. So 202 people that saw website one um, did not click on anything. 18 of what on website one uh, clicked on something. And you'll see website two, six people clicked versus 209 down here that um, didn't click. So this is very typical of of A-B testing, the click values are going to be much smaller than the non-click values because people who tend to go to the website usually don't interact with it, actually. So they would, in reality, it would look a lot like this. So just as we saw before, this is kind of our average or standardizing of our to get our expected values. So what you would expect if this those website one and website two didn't have a significant difference in the number of clicks. So we, again, as I showed you before, we would take that uh, column sum, like 24 down here, and our uh, row sum, 220, and divide it by the total number of observations. So this is gonna look, it's the same,